very good morning to, to you all. Um, yeah, so thank you for the kind introduction, Nancy. Um, yeah, so I think um, coming here at 8.30 in the morning is not just a challenge for, for foreign delegates like yourself. It's actually a challenge for myself too. Yeah, so um, it's heartening to see um, you all. I just want to thank you for being here in Singapore for the ICLS. And uh, I hope the Singapore team has given you sufficiently um, good hospitality. And um, I think um, you have a pleasant stay, especially for those, in Sing those living in the city, because you see the advancement of the Singapore landscape just by the mere buildings that are, are popping up over the years. OK. Um, I just, before I begin, I just want to preface this talk by telling you all that um, this is a journey that um, me and my colleagues, um, my colleagues uh, represented the names there, but actually the team comprises of more than this. Um, I have my colleague like Imran um, and many of my other uh, colleagues who actually walked this journey with me um, in trying to understand how inquiry-based practices or 21st century forms of learning uh, can be sustained in schools, in Singapore schools, uh, through our research efforts. Um, by and large, most of our research efforts that began, say, a decade ago, uh, could not sustain um, even, say, eight years later. So it's amazing to see how research-based innovations can find their way through into schools and remain there with the transfer of ownership of these uh, so-called 21st century process oriented learning innovations to the schools and to the stakeholders, the teachers and the school leaders. So this presentation uh, is more on the research practice end of the practice policy continuum, um, because I, one message which I hope to bring through is uh, bridging this research practice divide is far from a simple proposition. And um, bridging this divide the walls that forge between uh, research and practice is something that I myself and my team uh, have gone through in the last uh, decade. All right? So um, let me just proceed. Um, otherwise, we might leave this place at 11 o'clock. Yeah, OK. All right. All right, so um, basically, um, if you can understand, um, we have worked in the learning sciences primarily with students and, say, with a handful of teachers. But when it comes to issues of scaling, when it comes to issues of sustainability, it really involves more school leaders. Um, it really involves more getting teachers to be convinced of, of those innovations, even when researchers leave that um, school setup um, after a couple of years. So you find that the tensions that arise um, for our students is really trying to, in Singapore, when we are so well versed with tests, um, the disciplinary ways of seeing, um, seeing meanings, say in geography or in history or in the sciences, um, and yet coping with the demands of a high-stakes examination regime. Okay? The high-stakes examination, we are unabashed, is not going away anytime soon. Uh, we believe that that's a proxy indicator for our students' performances. Uh, sometimes parents get overly worried about these things, but uh, there is no better alternative solution as, as yet. So it will remain for a good time to come. Um, and then you see tensions arising for teachers because they are very able to succeed with performative pedagogies, I would use the term, but less able to do process inquiry in classrooms, in particular when uh, uh, timetabling periods in classrooms are constrained, when there is so much of content to cover uh, in, the, in, the, in the curriculum. These are issues and tensions that uh, teachers themselves face on a day-to-day -day basis. And how do we actually uh, move away from a frontal uh, kind of instruction like we are doing right now and towards a more teacher, um, student-oriented, democratic, process-oriented, dialogic, ideas-first form of pedagogy? I see Marlene and Carl. Uh, they, are, they should be happy to note that um, their work in knowledge building uh, is uh, well rooted in Singapore schools, although not that many, but uh, uh, sustained over the last decade. Uh, this is something uh, not at all simple to um, fathom. Yeah, and uh, the tensions faced by school leaders with respect to episodic experimentation vis-a-vis uh, -vis sustained um, innovations. Um, and not only uh, do we do it in one or two classrooms, we hope to do it across a whole grade level, 
even across the entire school, and even more recently, across a number of schools. Now, how, do, how does that happen in the, in the Singapore school system where the context reigns with um, often perceived by Western media teaching to the test? But it's not exactly all that. And so hopefully, in this presentation, I would show some of the insider, uh, commonly not untold stories about the journeys that our schools and our, our teachers and students take. Okay, so basically, um, like John Sealy Brown would say, uh, how do we actually, like a white water kayaker, skillfully read the currents and disruptions and the tensions that arise? Um, you know, I, I was told that this kind of uh, effect, this, this reverse effect of the, of the water currents happen uh, when we go to torrents like this. So how do, how do teachers and school leaders find um, ways to mitigate and overcome some of these tension points despite the pressures that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so I'll just show you some slides that uh, Singapore is very good at. I think you know all this, but just to give you a backdrop, you see we are doing so well, but um, often in the system we don't take these indicators too seriously because they fluctuate up and down, but we are doing reasonably well, um, way above the OECD average. Um, BBC had a... Uh, had, uh, comment that Singapore wants creativity. Uh, I think maybe because we are not doing too well on the innovation index. Um, not cramming. I have this perception that the Western media think that um, East Asian uh, um, education systems do a lot of cramming. Uh, in a way, yeah, when I see my children. But um, believe you me, when you look at the kinds of activity sheets and uh, practice sheets that they do, it's far more than procedural knowledge. Right? Um, if it's mere procedural knowledge, I don't think they can do so well in some of the PISA um, benchmark tests. Uh, but they do quite a bit of practice. Um, uh, maybe the practice could come in forms that are slightly different from a worksheet, but um, that's for another day. All right, so um, as far as the global competitive index is concerned, we do very well. As far as the um, um, higher education and training, we do very well. Uh, as far as innovation, we are not doing so well. And um, if you look at Israel, it doesn't feature in the top 10 list of the earlier two categories, um, but it's up there, the innovation, right? But Singapore is down here. So our policymakers are constantly wondering, why are we doing so well in all these crazy tests? But somehow, when it comes to the workforce, we're not doing very well. Um, NTU as a university has recently been so hyped up about our rankings. Uh, we are like number, I can't remember. Yeah, it's like number 10 or something like that. Huh? Uh, um, and I think if you, my German colleagues tell me that I think only one of their universities is ranked in, uh, in the list and uh, the, the, the workforce is, is highly commendable, right? So sometimes these proxies um, are useful. Um, they have a place, but I think we take it with a pinch of salt at times, yeah. All right, so um, this is the professor that hired me into NIE 20 years ago. He's retired right now. I thought I should mention him. In 2006, uh, he already mentioned that Singapore kind of lacks a, that inventive, innovation, entrepreneurial workforce. Hello? Yeah, okay. So, um, can we, I mean, this, this, see this orientation has been around for the last decade, and yet when you look at what's happening in our school system, uh, this kind of inquiry, innovation, dispositions are not finding its way into classrooms very easily. And the question is why? Okay, um, the question is to, to, that, that we want to think about today is why is it so difficult to have these into mainstream, everyday instructional and learning practices in classrooms? Okay. All right, so here is a quote from a, a school leader, a cluster superintendent actually, um, because in our work today, uh, we realize that involving our school leaders, our cluster superintendents, our zonal directors, right from the onset of our research matters a lot. Uh, rather than finishing our research and then putting our findings on a silver platter and say, here you go, it doesn't work, it doesn't get into um, their policy framings. And our research uh, experience to date has been when we involved some of these stakeholders right at the beginning of our journey, including the, the the co-construction of those research and development goals and questions, uh, we have found that those projects um, inevitably succeed because when our policymakers return to their own 
um, everyday businesses and, um, and meetings, they, they align to the kinds of experiences that um, they have found as co-partners in the research journey and are able to directly or otherwise influence the decision-making in their respective areas and positions in the hierarchy of the education system. So we have found a successful way in which um, involving stakeholders right from the onset of our research became a pivotal pillar for projects that um, are, of, are of more influence in our system. So here is a cluster soup that actually says that, um, you know, despite our, our students doing so well, um, and MOE, has, MOE is the Ministry of Education, has put in place a reduced curriculum content, 30% re reduced curriculum. And yet what happened in schools is, instead of filling that reduced curriculum time with inquiry and deepening of student learning, they, take the, they possibly take the upper years content and bring it down to the lower years, all with a view that if, they, if we teach content and master it earlier, the students would do well for the high stakes exams in time to come. So this Instead of doing the 21st century learning, schools inevitably sometimes find themselves, because they, they have to account to, the, to, to parents, they, they are responsible towards um, our students, and, and, and grades and doing well in examinations matter in the East Asian context. So even when we reduce curriculum time, how are we able to have our teachers become more competent with respect to the skill sets and the disposition sets needed for inquiry-based learning. So since 2003, every five years as an institution, we are the only school of education in the whole of uh, Singapore. You probably find this very weird, but uh, uh, we are the only. And we take in, we, we, do, we handle all teachers in Singapore, 20 over 1,000 of them, for pre-service and in-service. And um, it, it has its pluses and negatives. Uh, in terms of its pluses, we conceptually are able to rally teachers together, school leaders together, and, and influence them where possible, right? That's conceptually. But of course, the world of conceptualness doesn't always reign in the world of practice. But um, yeah, so ever since 2003, every five years, we do a kind of national uh, coding survey of the extent of teacher talk versus student interactions in a classroom. And... Um, I must say that frontal teaching has been for like 10 years very dominant. But of course, the, sample, the sampling was in grade 5 and in grade uh, 10, grade 7, 8, grade 9. And um, if you know our school system, grade 5 and grade 6 uh, are, are years that students take a lot of time uh, to prepare for exams. And the secondary 3 and 4 are also years where they take a lot of time to prepare for the we call O levels. Um, so, Maybe these two years are not fantastic years to see the kinds of student-centered pedagogies that may arise in the classroom. But my colleagues from the MOE and myself, um, having, um, I, I get the opportunity of going down to schools um, once a week for maybe half a day. Apart from that, I'm always doing administration in this university. But in that uh, half a day a week, uh, one day a week, and I, as I interact with the classroom teachers and school leaders, I find pedagogies um, really shifting towards a more process inquiry in, um, orientation. And so this is attested to many of my colleagues who actually do many visits down in schools today. So um, as far as movement of inquiry-based learning in schools, um, this circle, would, I would imagine, would actually be larger okay, um, as the years go by. So we try to infuse some of these things into the school system. And since 2005, we have set up the Learning Sciences Lab, and many of the researchers that has joined us actually were able to to practice um, design-based research interventions in our local schools, in their small and local uh, uh, manners. Okay? But the issue at hand for us is, how do we take these classroom efforts and bring it up to scale in, at a school level? may not be the intent of the researchers, but the, it's the intent of our funding, our funding um, uh, stakeholders. Okay? That they, they do not wish to just see research being on the fringes, but they, see, they hope to see research being translated into um, as many benefits to students as possible. So if you look at this um, chart here, we have a range of um, projects. Look at ideas first. When Kate Bilicek, I don't know whether you know her, was here with us a couple of years back, and now she's gone back to the US. She actually did um, knowledge building very deeply in one school. And, and henceforth, we have had um, MOE uh, specialist officers that now 
actually bridge knowledge building in 14 schools. And the extent to which the teacher take up has been very encouraging, to me at least. Okay? And then we have, um, I don't know whether you know Manu Kapu. Manu Kapu um, helmed his theory on productive failure. And um, about six years later, he managed to convince the entire, um, uh, he, he managed to convince the Ministry of Education to take about 10% of the A-levels stats curriculum and infuse it with um, productive failure methodologies. I, I think that it's a, a bridge version of um, the, the extent to which productive failure would be practiced if he would wished, but this is a very positive indication. But of course, Manu uh, has decided to move on to, uh, to Hong Kong, uh, which he didn't. Uh, we all take the bus here, but he takes the Airbus back to Singapore quite regularly. Yeah, okay. Um, all because I think the sustainability mechanisms for productive failure hasn't been um, actually so worked out. Um, okay, um, and then um, let me just show you. Um, so you see that later I will, I will show you some case studies on seamless learning, which Chikit, my good friend, uh, seeded in school since 2003 or 20, um, somewhere in 2005. Um, and then the number of years it took um, now with many of his postdocs um, doing it. Um, and then other examples that are researcher-led. Okay? So the question for us is, how do we move from researcher-led, research-funded, oriented projects into mainstream, MOE take-up, schools take-up, schools-led projects? This transfer ownership is far from a simple proposition. So let me just give you an overview of the kinds of... Um, so we have baseline studies. Every, every once in five years, we kind of get a global index of uh, our teaching and learning uh, patterns in classrooms. Uh, we have a range of interventions research. We hope to get folks like yourself to come and experiment in classrooms, uh, one at a time perhaps, innovation at the fringes. But after seven, eight years of research, we hope to kind of, using MOE's terms, harvest a, a range of interventions that has shown to succeed in one way or another in our schools and take them to the next systemic level. How do we do that? Because, um, how do we do that? So on the one hand, innovation at the fringes. On the other hand, a more systemic approach of uh, a, a less bottom-up approach, a less researcher-led approach. And then, of course, we have come to realize the whole notion of leadership and school improvement studies as a means of sustaining. And um, last but not least, um, under this EduLab umbrella, my MOE colleagues are up there. Uh, together with them in partnership, we work the ground in order to get teachers to take up these, um, and the structures involved to take up these innovations. So in a nutshell, we have research that range from student to national system level, the Singapore, Singapore as a system, and then we compare Singapore's system with other systems. And then we have very basic research in neuroscience, like one of them, yeah. Today, the fashion in Singapore is not learning sciences. It's called the sciences of learning. I don't know what the difference is, but it's neuroscience. And, um, and uh, my new, we have set up, after the learning sciences lab, an education cognition and development lab. And they are the ones getting the money in these days. They put up a $1 million grant on working memory, um, sometimes I, I look at the proposal, it sounds like the first keynote, the brain is like a muscle, you need to train it up, working memory, but they get the $1 million. <laughs> the learning sciences, design-based research methodologies, the reviewers look at it, MOE look at it, I can't understand this iterativeness. <laughs> the methodological design is too messy and they find it hard to continue to fund many of these grants. So it's a problem. I, I have no good solution, but we'll have to find how we can do these things. But the good news is, whenever the education minister comes here to visit us, he doesn't ask about neuroscience, thank goodness. Okay? He actually asks, how are the interventions that are being seeded in schools taking, uh, taking its, its course of um, work? He asks about change pedagogies in schools. And then, we, I just received an email, the deputy prime minister is coming next month, and I thought that he being the chair of the National Science Foundation, National Research Foundation in Singapore, would be coming to ask me about, ask us about neuroscience. Good thing the reply was, how is the change going of pedagogy taking place in Singapore schools? So our ministers are asking change in pedagogy. But of course, I think up their sleeves, they still have to fund neuroscience. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so more of late, um, we, we delve into this notion of these 
um, understanding the designs for scalability. And this is the work that um, Chikit, myself, and many of my colleagues who are seated there uh, go into schools on an everyday basis, getting to know, um, working alongside these design-based researchers who are given this mandate to try it out in more schools. But because our young um, learning science um, design-based researchers do not have that much traction with school leaders and superintendents and directors, we come alongside them. We have these dialogues with these school leaders. And my interesting observation is as we dialogue alongside the diffusion process, school leaders begin to realize what, what we are about. School, begin, school leaders begin to realize that we have to move ownership from research to practice. And it is it's engaging in these dialogues and co-partnerships with um, schools and the Singapore Academy of Teachers um, that they begin to see why research has to find a pathway to impact down at schools. So I think our work is important. Uh, we do not try to duplicate the work of our, design, uh, of our researchers at, who do the, the very good innovations, but we do the work alongside the mechanisms that afford for sustainability. Okay, so just to give you a, a backdrop, um, in 2003, when the Center for Research in Pedagogy and, Pedagogy and Practice uh, was established, we were given 48 million Singapore dollars. We are 1.3 to uh, one, 1 US dollar. And after 10 years, we are given 118 million dollars. We must be doing something right, right? But actually not so. We have a hard time trying to convince our policymakers that our research findings actually matter. And very often, um, they, we have only got 20 minutes with our policymakers, and the nuances that come forth from case studies and the details in which we do in design-based research never, lend, never get to their ear. All right, so this is a translation and trying to get research out into their perspective becomes a significant challenge for my office in which I'm currently um, working in. All right? I don't know how long I'll be there, but um, we'll, we'll, do our, we'll do our best. Yep, okay. So the Learning Sciences Lab was established in 2005. We have only $12 million, and we have had quite a few people come join us. Okay, today, most of them are not present with us, maybe just one third of them. Um, but 30, today, we have 38% of our funding in interventions in schools. And many of these interventions touch and go. Very few actually are able to have a sustainability trajectory. So, just to give you an um, overview, a sense of um, the kinds of work that we do, uh, we have... Um, you know, this is knowledge building and this is science, uh, history inquiry. And we have moved from transmissional basis to a more co-creation of knowledge. Um, this is uh, more monologic um, to didactic pedagogies. And bringing technology into classrooms is a big headache. You know, about eight years ago when Chikit brought and his colleagues brought um, uh, portable devices, um, it was not even then iPads or things like that, into the classroom. Um, it's only today when I visit the classrooms that the socio-infrastructure is more ready for devices like this into the classroom, bridging between the classroom and out-of-classroom learning. And for, for example, in this case, it's inquiry. Okay? So eight years to find stability of such things as a mainstream staple in classrooms. And then we have a case, um, immersive environments, for example, uh, here's a case where there's the XYZ coordinates and, and each one of these uh, students uh, have a different uh, view in, in their, in their in computers. And, and because Singapore has, it's a flat land and the hypothesis that um, Singapore students do not have intuition about terrains. And so the second best thing is to give them immersive environments, right? And with the XYZ coordinate at different uh, levels above sea level, they plot these contours, these maps. And then they bring the maps, superimpose them together, and then it becomes a social constructed uh, map. Um, a geographer's way of seeing meanings, right? Uh, forging uh, disciplinary intuitions, as my colleague would say, or Andy Decesser's notion of P-prims, um, something like that, okay? Yeah, so, and then we introduced maker spaces. Um, we go to the US, see what you do, and then always come back and do the same thing, but probably with the with, with not exactly the same tinkering uh, cultural dispositions. But these things are succeeding in schools. I went down to schools and I've been able to see teachers uh, really subscribing and believing in this pedagogy. Um, why? Because Singapore students dare not fail, 
that's the hypothesis because it's cost, too costly to fail. Um, even parents don't let them fail. Yeah. So give them an uh, augmented environment where they can learn to fail. Well, this is a bit pseudo, but um, better than nothing. Right? But some of these students um, are doing very well. Um, uh, we, would, uh, we, we don't want to label our students, but some of these students doing um, design and technology, uh, maybe the lower progress students academically, uh, have been able to find motivation in doing these things and identity expression in their schools. And then because of these on the side motivational expressions, they were able to find an identity projection at, even at their usual typical classroom activity. So I think it's a good thing anyway. Yeah. And then we have out of classroom. Uh, out of classroom, out of classroom uh, learning activities, a lot easier to do in Singapore schools. After the examinations, they go on a digital trail. And we like to expose teachers to these things first because since the classroom change is so difficult, let's try a good experience outside the classroom first. And then they'll be surprised at what their students can actually do. Now, this is an example of what we do with um, informal learning. We also have informal learning. Well, this girl, basically, um, we do ethnographic studies or more than that. Um, we actually uh, kind of select, identify some of these students and trace them through their course of their schooling years in the Singapore school system. It's not all cramming. This girl, for example, um, very creative to me in my mind. Um, the school doesn't allow girls to wear bands. I don't know why. Um, it's not allowed. So she, she hung a, a, walk, a clock around it and that becomes a watch. So now she can wear it. And then um, she, because there was no, because she loves to, to deconstruct a watch and put it back again all the time. She just loves doing it. So uh, her parents can only give her cheap watches, uh, nothing, nothing like an expensive one. And then because there are no dates, um, she actually put a, 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 a manual one that which can shift the date um, and show the day in which she's in. So these are untold expressions of our students, um, even as they go through crabbing, as it were. But I'd like to posit to you that she doesn't crab very much. Um, uh, she had, um, after we did this with her about two years ago, with the O-Levels exam, which is grade 10, uh, she had all distinctions, despite not mugging. Okay? Yeah. So, in a nutshell, what I wanted to show you is that we are beginning to, having seeded in a learning sciences lab eight years ago, a range of interventions, and these interventions came by the researcher's interest. Okay? And we'll continue to do that. But after eight years, we are compelled to be a bit more systemic. We ask ourselves, what portfolio of research proof of concepts that have already worked, that we can now take as a more organized manner and bring it to a, say, school cluster where we would have a plan to see these innovations that has had some traction in our school system in a more systematic way. Okay? So on the one hand, we continue to encourage innovations on the fringes. On the other hand, now that we have had some traction with innovations in the sciences, in the social sciences, innovations in the maker, maker spaces and even informal learning within classroom and out of classroom in disciplinary ways of learning, how can we now take these, even when the researcher is no longer around, in a more concerted manner to benefit students? And we are in that process of dialogue with school clusters in partnership right from the onset of the design. Although I'm somebody who did not manage to keep up the learning sciences so well, coming from another trajectory of managing a research office, I've come to almost the same conclusions as research practice partnerships. So ultimately, our, our policy makers want to see it benefit not just that one group of students. In the, in the earlier years, we always found schools that were easier to work with. Students were already academically quite good. But after a while, the Ministry of Education compelled us to say, I don't want to see your research in these schools. I want to see your research in the everyday heartland schools. And we want to see it work there. And we have been on this trajectory from, from good schools to everyday schools and now to a more organized and concerted cluster of schools in which we can do an experiment through which we can understand the mechanisms. So I'll talk about this if I get to this slide um, after a while. But these are uh, 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 the mechanisms that we, um, we have um, kind of 
um, delineated. All right. So again, um, to reiterate, it's always a collective journey, and um, appropriating Cynthia Coburn's work, for example, it's that shift of ownership. It's going deep, and it's sustaining it. Right. So let me just give you a quick, a, a quick preview of the Singapore school system. Um, we are very known to uh, bring forth top-down policies. Okay? Uh, we are a top-down system, therefore it's quite common to have a top-down policies. Sometimes an overdose of top-down policies, right? But um, of late, the um, ministry understands the need for ownership and autonomy at the school level. And this gradual shift from centralization to decentralization has been occurring over the last two decades, right? In the middle, we have a cluster of a school concept, and we have um, something like 340, 245 schools in the Singapore school system. And right now, only, only about 345 or 340 schools. Um, the number changes because of school mergers. So, yeah. So basically, it's, it's broken into four zones. And so you'll, you'll find that each zone would have about seven clusters, each cluster having about uh, 13 to 14 schools. And now our aim is to work as an experiment within a very typical cluster of 14 schools, look at all the mechanisms that might work or otherwise for, for sustainability, and then taking that, those mechanisms and bringing it to the zonal level and trying to bring it to the zone, and hopefully with a zonal model, we might be able to bring it to the system. Okay. Uh, some of these things are still in the works. Um, I'm not supposed to tell you too much, uh, but yeah. Okay. All right. So. Um, Looking at all the literature, I was rather perturbed because looking into all the systems people like Michael Fullen, who comes here quite regularly, um, uh, I'm not feeling the sense that there is a systemic framework that we can take um, reference from. Um, so um, I took Brock and Bernard's five layers of ecology and tried to see whether the Singapore school system could be met within these five, la five layers, and to see how alignments can be uh, forged within these five layers. Because if there are no alignments, you'll find that there's no sustainability. It's as simple as that. Okay? So how do we actually do that um, over time? How do we actually engage in research practice or practice research partnerships in order to bring these alignments? So just to reiterate, the first tension is the tension between high performance outcomes, which is a staple in our school system. It's culturally in our DNA. It's not easily removed. Even you want to remove all the examinations, the parents still want it. Yep. Okay. Versus a more process-oriented learning. The second tension is how do we actually take episodic um, interventions and bring it to more sustainability? Yep. And so let me just summarize by saying that um, if I were to map the five layers of problem awareness framework and I want to just collapse it to a more simpler frame of three layers, uh, macro, meso, and micro, and I will look at how the Meso interacts with the, um, the, the micro and how the micro uh, percolates upwards to the macro and vice versa in a two-directional manner to see whether there are any innovations in our, in our advent since uh, 2005 in the Learning Sciences Lab which were able to, uh, to find alignments across these three and then posit the kinds of um, mechanisms that we hope to understand. All right. So I like Jim Spillen's work because in one sentence, he kinds of paraphrases what the issue is, that we want to change things. Learning in context changes the context itself. Now, how in the world do we do such research when all your variables get messed up, right? And so we sometimes, I think, call it design-based research. But our policymakers cannot understand these things too, too well. Okay? So how do things happen when everything needs to co-evolve and co-inform co and, and the intertwining relationships between leadership, curriculum, pedagogy, and teacher profession all happen at the same time? All right, so let me just go through the three layers quickly and just delve on some of the literature that I think um, can help us. Right, so uh, Michael Fullen and Van de Vin would say that if you want sustainability in classrooms, it really is uh, it's, um, involving all parts of the education system. Well, we, all, we all know that, okay? The problem is that I know some of these things, but I do not know how to go about doing it. Yeah. And so even a deputy uh, school leader who used to uh, work on one of those innov innovations actually realized the need for sustainability um, as, the, as the end goal of what we do. Okay, so if we look at system improvement work, um, um, you'll find that they tell you uh, many, uh, many very sensible tenets, okay? You need a strong implementation team to 
to support the change process. Yeah, I know that. Um, you need a multi-level engagement and strong leadership in a guy lean coalition. Yeah, okay. Um, what does that actually mean in practice? Uh, that means all, all, all parties and stakeholders. And we need continuous learning with effective use of research data. Now, that's certainly true because when we are able to show in a systematic way the kinds of learning gains our students have, it somehow is able to attract more funding. Um, and then we look at school improvement work and we find that if the larger system is more coherent in its relationship, then uh, you'll find that the change strategy that works for their respective school um, will become more optimal. Um, and then we know that um, very sensible, very common sensical things that McKinsey a few years um, said uh, in their report. I wonder why we paid money so much to McKinsey to tell us that teacher quality is the most important variable, but, that, but that, that's how they earn money. Yeah, okay. So um, the effect size of, um, of uh, teacher training is uh, uh, teacher uh, learning and development 0.84 against other more administrative uh, variables. And what's important here is I think um, the importance of recognizing that different systems, especially like East Asian contexts, have different assumptions and cultural nuancing compared to uh, more Western-centric. And we need to understand it from that indigenous context in order to understand how change occurs. So um, just to reiterate some of these very sensible tenets, um, but again, I'm looking for a more systemic way of policy to practice alignment, misalignment, dialectical uh, framework that can inform us of this change process. Um, so, so Richard Elmore would say that, you know, it's actually not an assumption that teachers can actually learn on the job by observing other teachers in classrooms um, and opening classrooms and deprivatizing classrooms. Very, very obvious, but in practice, very difficult to do. But uh, lo and behold, in Singapore classrooms, within our interventions, um, this has been actually happening. And it's heartening to note that um, teachers are a lot more confident in actually having other fellow teachers come visit their classrooms. Okay, so just to move on to the meso level, um, uh, Michael Fullen, who comes here occasionally, um, tells us about leadership from the middle. Um, I think this concept is quite interesting to me uh, because as I delve into seeing how this, um, the mechanisms for innovations, uh, I realized that uh, getting a cluster of schools together and finding out these, working on these mechanisms really does have a sustainability um, uh, um, um, way of doing things, okay? And so, because leadership becomes so important to us as far as sustainability is concerned, we delve into a whole range of literature on leadership, and um, there's so much overlap in many of these terminologies. I was quite distraught when I went through some of these things. Um, and so I concluded that our research indicates no single model of leadership uh, satisfactorily captures the cluster school and teacher leadership and enactments in our uh, interventions, innovations trajectory. So it's a combination of a few of these things and then some indigenous aspects through which we characterize the kinds of teacher leadership work and school leadership work. All right, so in a nutshell, um, I want to go down to the plunge down to the micro level because I know that your community here do, that's a lot of microgenetic analysis. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of uh, excerpts to show you the tensions that teachers face. Uh, the fear for failure, the fear for being willing to try, and the inertia to move to a more embodied participatory form of learning. Um, and students cannot let, teachers cannot let go of their authority in the classroom. And they worry a lot because they can't preempt the kinds of questions that students would ask. Um, they have to finish the curriculum and, and finish the lessons. And this, this is their, their, their meaning of being responsible. And Singapore teachers are very responsible. And so there is no way of attending a class, a workshop in NIE and telling them to let go. It doesn't work that way. They have to be shown how to let go of their teacher-centric frontal pedagogical um, authoritative stance. So our research shows that it just epistemic shifts, that means shifting the way they view knowledge um, from them as a source to a more democratic process becomes a very high leverage point for sustainability. So these are some uh, points of um, our interviews with teachers. And, you know, for example, this teacher, when we interviewed, uh, he says, I started to appreciate pedagogy. You know, it sounds just the same words, you know, but what he means is when he was in NIE, he gone through all the courses he was taught pedagogy, but, okay, just pedagogy. But when he did these innovations, he began to realize what really is pedagogy, right? And um, 
For example, my eyes were opened when I began to see my students being able to do things that um, they did not fathom um, earlier. All right? So these are some quotations from some of our teachers. And then um, this is a quotation of a teacher who was actually teaching science, primary science, for the so-called uh, lower progress science uh, students. And they were teaching it to the usual ways, you know, and the student effects were not there. Student engagements were not there. And then they tried, actually in this case was knowledge building, and then they were so surprised. You mean your students could do this? You know, so these embodied experiences made a difference. So um, just to clarify, epistemic learning to us, just a, a quick definition, is coming to a process where how they come to know something has changed. All right. Now, this is akin to John Bransford's notion of adaptive expertise because Singapore's teachers are great with respect to their performance pedagogies, but now asking them to do something different, yet to be able to teach to the test when the, when the time of the year is come that they have to do some things like that, they are able to do both in their repertoire of pedagogical toolkits. So how do we actually achieve both? It's another way of framing the issue. All right, so just in a nutshell for my MOE colleagues who are up there, sometimes um, I, yeah. So, all right, so we have to look at the, the, the three macro, meso, micro layers of the system, looking at the mechanisms for sustainability and looking at leadership at the cluster, school and teacher levels in order to see teacher shifts and student outcomes. So um, I think we are reminded that although we can do a lot of systemic changes at the macro level, ultimately it's the change at the teacher which is the heart of it. Yeah. So just to give you a preview, I have yet to even touch my uh, three case studies, but basically the three case studies connote the macro, meso, micro layers. All right, so here's the methodology of the first one where we go alongside um, intervention projects and we basically um, have reflective dialogues with school leaders. All right, so just to point out, I want to show you that um, there is an indigenous aspect of the Singapore school system and the culture here, which I think very few um, of us realize. It's actually helped, I'm actually helped by my sociologically oriented um, colleagues who go into cultural studies. Now, the East Asian context recognizes power distance. Power distance is when there's a hierarchy and uh, there are power differentials. And very often, it's not easy to, to bridge these power gaps because of the culture in which we are in. So we have a system like that. So when the boss says do something, normally it's being done whether voluntarily or otherwise. Okay? But it's that, that is power distance. All right? And then another notion is that, yet yeah, on the other hand, there is a lot of collectivism for the social good. All right? So whilst we might not have so much agency in doing something, but for the collective good, we are willing to do something. So these were some of the experiences that can explain some of our um, teachers' behaviours. Right? And the third um, thing which comes from an efficiency mindset of a bottom line KPI, we mentioned, our guest of honor mentioned, key performance indicator. Teachers have a need to perform to the perceived expectation. Right? So this actually efficiency mindset comes from a historical chrono system perspective of how in a good 45 to 50 years, the Singapore's education system has ranked so highly. What, it was more top-down than bottom-up. Okay? But of late, there's been a lot of bottom-up emphasis. So that it explains why the psyche of our teachers are the way they are. Right? And perfectly reasonable. So here's an example of an intervention um, on seamless learning where, um, where this was the node school in which um, the interventions first started. Okay? And you'll find that from this school, it spread to five other schools and subsequently six other schools. And what was done was that you see uh, fellow other teachers from schools, from those five and six other diffusion schools, coming to observe such a so-called messy classroom. You seldom see such a messiness in um, Singapore classrooms. Okay? And then you will find um, apprenticizing uh, teachers who have had experience in enacting these process-oriented inquiry, um, open-ended science inquiry questions um, alongside the classroom to help teachers who are practicing the craft. And then what's interesting is they, they come back um, once in two weeks from five schools and they co-design the lessons from a very frontal form of instruction to a very dialogic form of instruction. And then 
what's happened in this school is that um, they take the ideas learned from such a context and actually reappropriate it into their own department's uh, visions and plans. And this school in particular had greater sustainability because the school was able to appropriate it to their own, um, own schemes of work. So let me give you an example. Now, when this school principal, the Nodal School principal, wanted to do this work, the first obvious thing the school did, want, uh, the principal wanted to do, is to connect the superintendent. Okay, because he he knows that without the superintendent's support, he cannot get the five other schools or six other schools on board. And then you find that the the people who have had experience doing the enactment knew that this enactment cannot be just a set of curriculum materials and given out to teachers from the other schools without any form of dialogic meaning making and interpretation. Right? So it's not a rollout, as it were. All right, so another consistent view to our indigenous context is that when we spoke to the, you know, these, I, I put former here because all these school leaders that were in the original Nodal school all left the school and got posted to other schools. The crux of the test to the pudding is do these innovations still remain even after the school leaders left the school? It does, okay? So very much so, um, this deputy um, a school leader basically says, um, get get to the school leaders first, because if you can't get the school leaders' support, you can't get the rest of the people's support. And then we interviewed the new principal that came into the nodal school, and um, without much earlier ado, the new principal also said, get the beliefs of those teachers who are convinced about the innovation, get them coming, and then go out and reach to the school leaders of the other schools. Very consistent indigenous knowledge of our school leaders to how diffusion were to take place in our, in our school system, even though they have no theoretical knowledge of what diffusion is all about. Okay? So here's an example of adaptive expertise where, where teachers' experimentation must be within boundaries, according to this um, school principal. And um, after they were able to see the gains of students, both by our researchers when they report the student learning gains, and more critically, when they actually visit those classrooms where these interventions work, and they said, my, can these students actually do this? So these were very powerful uh, mechanisms. So here's an example of a school appropriating the innovation because um, it's not a I take it and I replicate. It's really building expertise, a transference of ownership, okay, and building a core expertise at the school's end in order to recontextualize and reappropriate into their school's context. Now, here's a very interesting indigenous example. Okay, so here is a, so the five schools or the six schools came about and then characteristic to our school system, people were assigned to um, join the professional learning communities as it were. Okay, so here was this lady who was saying, you know, when I first came, I was just tolerating these, these sessions. Uh, I didn't accept it, you know. Um, and then in the whole process, he or she um, got to hear the multiple perspectives of those who had undergone these, expect, um, these innovations and began to say that, hey, actually there is a lot of value in, in these things. And he says, why should I be a blocked vessel? And finally, when she was able to have uh, acceptance to, 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 to this work, uh, she was able to subsequently find some, some joy in accepting it. So let me just show you a quick overview of the journey taken um, by this person. And so you know, uh, groups come together and teachers like, like her are quite unwilling, but we have good facilitators who understand the psyche of these teachers, right? Of course, they've gone through it. And then they visit these classrooms, and then in the, in the network learning communities, they try to foster a level of trust and accountability. They try to shift the ownership over to those teachers. And about eight months later, um, you begin to see this willingness to participate. So in a nutshell, I would just like to characterize my first case study by saying that um, in the Singapore school system, there is a lot more distributing downwards, percolating, you know, like coffee percolating, per percolating downwards. We are top-down system, or used to be, but now centralized, decentralized. But there is a lot less percolating upwards. Now, percolating upwards is very necessary for a centralized system like ours because if we don't percolate upwards, our school leaders and our district uh, directors may not understand what's going on and then 
um, there are misalignments that, that take place. And this percolating up and down, my colleague Yan Sito somewhere there, basically says that in the different ecological layers, macro, meso, micro, mitigating the systemic paradoxes as well as the local and cross school tensions. So I would like to characterize a new term called ecological leadership. It's not new, it's published somewhere. Yep. Right. So um, contextualizing it again to the indigenous context, you realize that there is an, a high need for apprenticizing leadership in an adaptive expertise context. Teachers here may start rather involuntarily, but with good facilitating, there could be a way of achieving collectivism. Right? Um, one school principal actually says, instead of saying it negatively, she sees it as a privilege that the superintendent actually chose her school to participate in that innovation. So some of these not so intuitive um, um, characterizations. And so ecological leadership is again another very important tenet through which um, 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 sustainability occurs. So in a nutshell, case study two will delve more further into apprenticizing leadership and case study three into ecological leadership. So case study two, apprenticizing leadership from leadership in the middle where our very solid um, uh, specialist officers, just now the case study one was an NIE-led researcher intervention. Now it's an MOE-led specialist officer working in knowledge building in 14 schools. I have to be fair, I chose one from each context, otherwise I might get into trouble after this. Yeah, okay. So, so um, here is a case study delving deep into one teacher's experience. Um, okay, so, so here is this one teacher's experience, six years in the learning trajectory where he was, he was first exposed um, to um, this pedagogy in a science context, although he was a history teacher. And then subsequently um, getting to know the the particular innovation through the work of this leader from the middle, I would characterize it, and then gradually enacting it in the classroom, and then gradually being a periphery to a core member in this community. So this is a six years trajectory, maybe uh, not so linear, but can be characterized as acquisition, participation, and transformation. Right, so here is an example of this teacher who had started six years ago in a very frontal way, but now he uses it more in a summative at the end of the classroom, okay? And activities were, were following activities, but now activities have brought in a whole lot of additional meaning. And then here is um, epistemic agency, knowledge building, but here is an a, a intervention that aligns very well with epistemic learning. Um, and I think you are not unfamiliar with the democratization of knowledge here. And he, but the important point is that this leader from the middle, i.e. the Ministry of Education, working in a cluster of schools with respect to this particular innovation. This cluster is not the formal cluster of the Ministry of Education, but schools that come in a bottom-up fashion to be willing to take up the innovation. So this has been successful in the past, but going forward, we hope that we would capitalize and leverage on the formal cluster system of the education system. So here's an example of the pervasiveness of knowledge building for inquiry um, in our classroom. Even after uh, three months, six months, students were still able to remember what was learned. Here's an example of agency on the part of the teacher because whilst the apprenticizing leader was more in science, but the teacher was able to take his disciplinarity and his understanding and, and infuse it as part of the uh, pedagogy he would use in the classroom. So here's an example of um, students taking perspectives, views, in um, history, in this context, World War I was Germany at fault, and um, taking evidences and building upon it, and, um, and seeing contextualized interpretations uh, supported with evidence with uh, historical reasoning. Now, this teacher would tell me, compared to the last batch of students of the same cohort, these students were able to appropriate these disciplinary ways of seeing historical meanings. Here's an example of how this student was able to defend why Germany was not always at fault or not all at fault um, and contextualized it to a schoolboy, AB, bully, non-bully situation and about aggression and defensive behavior. And if the non-schoolboy were, were to defend itself, would it be actually blamed for actually um, the act? So the last slide here to show historical um, nuancing in which concepts um, on cause and effects and consequences in shaping historical events uh, were able to be manifested in our classrooms. Yep. 
All right, so in a nutshell, um, teacher apprenticeships from the middle is important. Um, and this case study exemplifies the issue of ownership. Now, in the last example, I want to illustrate the tensions that arise from this alignments or otherwise of the macro, meso, micro layers of the system. Now, here's an example. Um, in Singapore, efficiency driven, there's this mad rush to get things done when you bring down the upper set content of syllabus to set one. So this is an example of content reduction, but schools and teachers, because they're so afraid, they, they want their students to do well for the high six exams four years later, they bring the curriculum from the upper secondary to the lower secondary. So maybe when they take the 15-year-old test, they do so well because they have learned all the concepts already. They're yeah, just kidding. Yeah. So here's an example of policy misalignment because even when there is a policy need to reduce content, teachers might not have the ability or the competencies or the dispositional skill sets in order to make use of that reduced curriculum 30% time. All right. So there is a question of saturated curriculum space. So here's another example of alignment. And you see something like this, it's an alignment. It's because there's, there are principles, not that many of them. We hope to see more and more of them. This principal was able to survive a grade six high stakes exam dip. Okay? And, um, and got the whole school together because she, she practiced these things. And, um, and then the crisis became an opportunity for teacher learning. And then years later, the teacher actually said, I don't see actually a disconnect or tension between performing to the test and doing some of these process inquiries. So here's an example of a... So as the teacher, as the school leader, actually brings about alignments in the school's processes in order to facilitate the teacher's work. Here's another example of the same school um, principal percolating upwards to the superintendent because nowadays the superintendent, they do not look for compelling results all the time. And this two-way process of which the school leader speaks and convinces the soups, the school does know what's going on. It does really matter. And this school too, parents know that if they don't want to send kids to a high stressful um, school context. I went to this school and there were many expatriate children in this school. And so it's a very good sign to see that this school actually practices holistic education. So again, an alignment. So here's an example of a misalignment. Okay, here, here's an example of um, two teachers, basically. Um, they trained up a whole group of teachers to succeed in this innov innovation. But no, it just collapsed. I say, what for? I train people and then collapse. Singapore English. Okay, right, so it collapsed. It simply collapsed, all right? Right, there's a, there's a gap, all right? And then what happened is that the new principal comes in and then the MOE creates a new policy called flip classrooms, anything that comes from elsewhere. Flip classrooms. And then they were able to say, hey, the thing I'm doing actually aligns to flip classroom. And because of that, the principal didn't stop me from doing and that's very good. And, and there was again this percolating upwards for the, for the school leader to be able to believe in the innovations that are taking place. All right, so I'm, I jump on, I shift a gear and I want to show you the socio-technical infrastructures that are needed in the macro, meso and micro layers in order to show that um, these things have to work. Now, in the audience, there are master teachers from the Singapore Academy of Teachers, and it's because the MOE set up a teacher track, and not just a school leader track, that school teachers can specialize in pedagogy and advance and get promoted up the, up the, the, the career. All right? And this track actually fosters certain social leverages for these school leaders to operate from non-within school contexts, in, in other words, inter-school structures. And so we have master teachers from the, from the academy, lead teachers who operate at the cluster level. And so here's an example of a lead teacher who basically one day might become a master teacher and he was able to see and sustain these innovations. Here's a same teacher who basically, before, um, before then, she was working at the school level and she was able to these innovations in terms of classroom management, questioning, and so on and so forth. So these are cluster level structures of which now she is operating at the cluster level. And then here's an example of a socio-technical structure at the school level 
where the school principal needs to actually integrate processes, look at time, timetabling, all these funding, professional development mechanisms in order to make things work in his or her school. Even for technology, getting a te technical assistant to stand by when uh, teachers are executing these, these things. All right, so these are very important mechanisms. So I come to this slide. So my colleague um, and I, my colleague Yancy, Azi, and so on, they, they appropriated a concept by Ron Etner, ecosystem carryovers. Now, um, so when teachers are able to do professional learning communities at their school, within school levels well, there is a carryover effect of such learnings to the network learning communities at the cluster level, right? right. So these are carryover effects, like, like the iTunes or iPhones or the iPads or the, the iPods. There's a carryover effect um, of such technologies. So Ron Edna posits a carryover effect that um, needs to be in place in the system for it to sustain. And so structural carryovers are the kinds of um, professional learning communities that are structured, enabled by leadership in the middle, um, proponents by school leaders, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, these are open classroom rules that teachers could actually uh, come to visit um, classrooms. This, this is a structural carryover effect that, are, that is needed in order to sustain in classrooms. Then this economic carryover is important because you know, with technology, since we, we introduced it in 1997, oh dear, without the funding for such uh, um, technological equipment, you'll find that it will never find its root in, in classrooms, okay? So the whole works as far as databases, stability, um, networks, so on and so forth. And then there's the social cultural carryover, the carryover where school principals um, require teachers to experiment, take risk occasionally, for example, uh, find mechanisms through which they can actually um, uh, accommodate the kinds of interventions that they learned from a particular school context into their own respective ones. And then finally, the epistemic carryover where we see shifts and we see teachers working at not just the school level, but at the cluster level. Okay. So, Again, I list down some of the tenets that enable these things to take place in our schools. Where at the school level, there are, there's culture of innovation, risk-taking, a, a low recourse to failure. At the meso level, there is apprenticeship learning taking place by teacher-to-teacher -teacher peers, facilitated by PLCs, peer observations, open classrooms, embodied participation in lesson co-designs. And at the school micro level, these evidences of student outcomes. This is our conceptualization of leadership from the middle. I will come to a, a greater extent of that. But you'll find that key teachers and master teachers who can work at the middle level and creating the infrastructures for apprenticizing leadership and creating the learning communities that enable adaptive expertise to take place. And they're at the school level and at the policy level. We need to find alignments across these three. And here is our characterization. Because even as we saw the three M layers, we also began to see a fractal concept within the three M's. That means there are three small M's within the three big M's. And then you'll find that if every school innovation champion is able to take leadership and percolate upwards, and percolate upwards, you'll find that um, sustainability of diffusion best, would best occur. So now we are working with a cluster superintendent, and that's her, his boss. And um, we are seeing how this range, the range of, um, the range of uh, interventions that we want to take forward to the next level can seed in our, in our classrooms. So again, um, after we realized from our data that there are three small M's within the three big M's, hey, we encountered a Michael Fullan said the same thing too. Okay, right. So, so here is our characterization of um, what um, Uh, um, uh, a conceptualization that we did together with the Academy of Teachers, where al although we wanted teachers to have their interest-driven needs, there are needs that have already been established. Teachers do not need to start from ground zero, especially with proof of concepts that were already established via our interventions. How do we take perhaps the supposedly involuntary initiations to voluntary 
participation of teachers because not all interventions in our school system need to start from ground zero. So we characterize this map where the teacher is the heart of change, formative need and professional need as a basis within the professional learning communities and network learning communities in Singapore. All right, so here is an example of but with agency and ownership, um, we mitigate the very process through which we hope epistemic learning could take. King with a cluster, we began to realize, now we are working one-on-one -on -one with teachers, we are working at informal clusters. How do we have a mechanism to be able to reach out to more teachers? teachers? And we reckon, reckon there are three kinds of situated professional development out in schools. Level one, we can have more participation by teachers because this is the, less intens the least intensive. Then we have level two where we actually give them some embodied experiences, open classrooms, so on and so forth, more intentional. And level three, we narrow down where we can identify the innovation champions that could be seated at the middle in order to help sustainability. So, summarize, mechanisms, alignments, ownership, teacher ownership, meet up with apprenticeship, and um, finally, we just want to draw some implications to teacher education. You know, in Singapore, we have a leverage to all the school leaders in, in the system. It's not like the US where we have a thousand schools of education. We only one school of education. All the leaders come. There should be a way of reaching out to them in a more concerted way. Then we form partnerships. And now we are in the stage where we get these partners to jointly construct research agendas from the onset of the goals. And then we reflect with them through the whole sustainability journey. And then we work with school clusters, building capacity and teacher positioning. Two and level three, and then getting opportunities where they can actually enact and do the practice when they're out there in the cluster. Right. So this, um, the loom, okay. And uh, we leverage upon the zonal and the system in order to do this. Okay, so this is again a nutshell of what we think we can do it at a more systemic level at the next stage of our presentation. And then we try to understand at every level what takes place. Um, and I came to know that there's such a thing as called design-based implementation research. I seldom have time to go for conferences, so I hear it from my colleagues. I didn't want to mention it too much because I haven't read it myself, but uh, my journey in the office have found that involving the stakeholders right from the onset is very similar to uh, DBIR. But I think I want to show into all these DBIR iterativeness. There is a place for understanding the indigenous context and knowledge through which that ground and territory you are playing in uh, is, is about. And then this whole notion of social capital with school leaders because you want to get the things going. You really need people that can, that can interact and partner at all levels of the system. And we can engage in these very sensible, reflective dialogues with these um, decision makers. And then finally, the whole notion of teacher identity positioning for a more situated, authentic, embodied form of uh, learning on the job, as it were. Okay, so finally, I just want to conclude by my first slide by saying that we must collectively do it, um, not just the school leaders, not just the teachers, not just the students, it's easier said than done. Uh, we could involve many exo layer folks like yourself. We are more than happy that you can come and join, be a consultant to us, advising us how we can conceive of a systemic framing through which we can actually engage in a practice research, research practice partnership. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David. Wow, it's a very, very rich, um, you know, disposition or exposition of the journey and a lot of case studies and a lot of concepts uh, involved. So I'm sure. Uh, the, many of the audience would be um, interested to ask more questions or give comments.
Hi, David. Hi. I'm Seng Chi. Uh, thanks for the very inspiring talk. Um, I look at this model and I think, wow, wonderful. And it's so complex. And my question is, does it require a divine combination of people from all these three levels in order for something to be diffused and sustained over years? Or is it, um, I, yeah, so is it a divine combination of all, the, all these people? A, a what? A divine combination? Combination, yes. <laughs> well, Thank I'm you. not sure about divine. <laughs> um, if you want to experiment one-on-one um, -on -one classrooms, I don't think you need um, all, all these. Um, work with the, the teachers who are involved. Um, influence them. But if you want to work at scale, and if at scale is the needed understanding from the onset of your design, then I think you need to involve them from the onset. Why? You know, we have gone through this journey with the Educational Technology Division. And we, initially, eight years ago, we started with expensive technologies, these very strong research and solid um, innovations. But today, my colleagues and I know that these will not find its place in the school system eight years later. So, on the one hand, we have small-scale interventions by local researchers. On the other hand, we need to enthuse another group of researchers who are here from the, for the long haul, who are here that can understand these mechanisms and actually enact out in practice the socialities needed for that research practice, practice research partnerships. So you don't need everybody from the onset, but for a systemic improvement exercise, I think you need to involve. And I give an example of one of the more successful projects that we have. We have one five million project and we have one um, other teacher learning education project. And the one, dividing, one overriding divine tenet is involving that policy maker in that project from the And that really made a big difference. And then the other five million project, every six months, called up to the Ministry of Education to update the ministry what was going on with respect to the findings of that project. This partnership in its manifold forms, depending on the impact trajectory that we're talking about. Well, uh, okay, Marlene, you have a question? Uh, my name is Josh Rodinsky from University of Illinois at Chicago in the Learning Sciences program there. Um, and I want to just thank you for a deeply inspirational talk. Um, I, I couldn't keep up with you. Uh, my fingers are cramped and uh, my phone is full of pictures. Um, <laughs> but but I, I'm just moved and amazed by the, the uh, fluid integration of, of um, policy, research, and pedagogy in your thinking about these problems. But the fact that you're thinking about them and acting on them at the same time. In Chicago, we are at a, an impoverished level of trying to do um, this, this kind of work. And uh, I'm learning deeply from Singapore and from your work right now. And I just hope that we can bring back to Chicago this way of thinking. Uh, um, people believe that, that, that policy, research, and practice can't live together. And I think that you show us that it can. I, I'm very moved and inspired by your work and by what you're doing in Singapore. And um, maybe we can um, bring you back to Chicago. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We are just a small system. And um, we often say uh, we are like a living lab. We are not huge like your districts in elsewhere, only 340 something schools. But we have a living lab. And we welcome, welcome you to come and see if we can find all fine um, policy, practice, and research. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Glauco. I'm from Brazil. Hi. And uh, I'm very interested on, this, on the whole system to understand uh, the, the, the whole of the, the, the partnership of the, the teacher, tra teacher training program with the in-service uh, uh, teachers. I mean, how, how, how university and high schools are together. Thank you for a very pointed question. I must be honest to tell you 
that um, after about eight years, um, the translation of research into pre-service, in-service programs, uh, we can do a lot more. <laughs> in other words, uh, we can do a lot more. We are lacking. I think um, we are a system in which causes are helmed by individuals who hold on to particular causes um, all their life. And mitigating some of these issues, um, trying to find translational pathways from research all the way down to the pre-service beginning teacher program. Um, it's something we're still working, although we are supposedly one school of education. So um, of late, um, we, are begin, we, are, we are beginning, the Office of Educational Research is having conversations with the Office of Teacher Education and Graduate Programs where we are trying to frame systemic programmatic proposals where we can take research into programs at the NIE. But my team and I are reaching out to the school leaders first because we, we, we think that that leverage point is one of the highest that we can, um, we can embark in. And we have been given this opportunity to work with school leaders at our um, uh, education um, principals program. Yes, Marlene. Don't scare me, Marlene. <laughs> You talk about uh, systemic change, and um, yesterday we had a comment uh, from um, David Estance of OECD, who was really talking about uh, the need for public relations, bringing family, parents, that an awful lot of these innovations seem rather frightening because this might do worse by tests, they might not cover the curriculum. And then if you look at, I think, what the first level of understanding of the innovations are, it's giving students more autonomy, giving students more agency. But then that kind of conflicts with coverage of the curriculum, yep. uh, with handing, uh, handling standardized <laughs> tests. And yet if you look at what the teachers are literally doing, they're not throwing the curriculum away, they're yep. dealing with it with a greater level of responsibility, um, making sure that those questions span the curriculum, yep. that they're deep. Anyhow, I, I, I've been terribly impressed in the last two days with teacher innovations. And I'm just wondering what it is we can do or how you see in your model doing more justice to the deep innovations of teachers. It's a much deeper uh, analysis that's needed if we're going to have public relations, if we're actually going to get families and people engaged. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that broader context of yeah. systemic change. Thank you, Mali. Um, so I think any change takes a long, long time, um, over a decade, if, if not more. Um, I just want to attest to Marlene's point that when I interviewed the teachers in knowledge building, uh, they were able to uh, cover unexpected um, topics in the curriculum much later in the linear trajectory of that curriculum by having students' ideas and inputs. So they do what we call curriculum mapping. They kind of know what exactly are the, the topics that we covered for the year. And then um, they let the classroom be students be autonomized and students ask all kinds of questions. And, find, and interestingly, they were able to finish the curriculum faster than the linear approach if they would do it in the traditional way. So um, that was one very surprising thing. Um, although they basically um, spend a lot, time, a lot more time upfront in trying to analyze students' notes and trying to have this formative way of assessing what students actually know, they actually save time later by having an um, investment earlier but pay off later. So many of these were testimonies of our teachers when, they, when I interviewed them. Now, the second notion, uh, whether or not our parents can be more enlightened with respect to some of these things. Um, the Ministry of Education has set up a parents' unit, outreach unit. I'm um, uh, not sure how the progress is. But um, um, I think over time, we have asked ourselves how our research can actually um, 
benefit uh, parents and we were even thinking of having parent outreach programs helped by the NIE uh, on our research findings because ultimately we know that um, a lot of things happen when the kids go back home after the classrooms and parents, if they have no epistemic change in views, um, they send their kids to lots and lots of tuition, not just in Singapore, but in the East Asian context. Um, so um, not an easy solution. We don't know how to reach out to parents, but we're beginning to even think of having newsletters that we could write um, by way of reaching out to, to, to parents. And maybe one day we could even invite parents to classrooms um, and show to them that even when they do this kind of pedagogy, they can still perform to the test. Not sure if that, that answers that question, but um, it's an important one. Yes, Carl. What oh, frightening, frightening car. <laughs> <laughs> Many countries would be ha very happy to be ranked ninth in the world in innovation. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I have two questions about that. Uh, that is, why is that ranking seen as uh, not sufficient here? And s secondly, uh, how does it happen that education school level education is being taken seriously as a way to boost innovativeness. Hey, thank you, Carl. I guess um, recently, if you have read the newspapers, the government in Singapore what you call Skills Future Program. Um, Skills Future Program is with a view to leveling up lifelong learning dispositions. So I think um, they have this conception that whilst our students are doing very well in schools, somehow after graduating, from the point of graduating to say 25 years old, when minister was here, he asked me, why aren't you doing a longitudinal study up to 25 years old? I said, minister, why 25? He says, I feel 25 is important. <laughs> why? Because he feels that um, at 25, you will see whether the kids have an entrepreneurial kind of disposition. Um, I was telling the minister that maybe recently, when you look at the way kids are choosing their subject combinations in the university, they're not all the traditional money-making, uh, high-status jobs like medicine and uh, law and engineering. That our kids these days are a lot more open to all kinds of other pursuits. Maybe it's the young gener younger generation. But he wanted to be assured that, um, because he probably heard from a lot of uh, employers out there, that our, our children are not as enterprising or innovative as perhaps our foreign counterparts. Maybe they have too much knowledge inside here. And uh, maybe as a result of too much knowledge and, not, and, and the unwillingness to to fail, to fail, or they have to make it to the test because you know, the, 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 test, the test meritocratic system has been embedded in our system for years. Right, so our ministers probably heard from employers that our kids are not that creative or innovative, perhaps. Um, so why is innovation necessary for the school system? Um, I guess perhaps from the national surveys that we do um, and the kinds of the lack of student agency in our schools could suggest that our students, though they know a lot, may not be very confident in standing on their feet, very confident in asking questions in public. You find that in a situation like that, very few East Asian people stand up, right? except for Sing Chi. Yeah. That's a unique indigenous aspect. After the meeting, you'll find them coming to talk to their lecturers. So they're less um, open to public discourse. And um, that doesn't mean that they can't think. But I think there's a hypothesis by our deputy prime ministers who were education ministers back home back then that if we could tweak some of these things early, just like what they're doing to early childhood now, if we can do it early, um, you'll find that some of these competencies could be trained or developed or cultivated, fostered 
um, from early on. Thank you very much. Um, is there any, well, we, I think we can have time for one more question, if there's any. Hi, I'm Amy Ogan from Carnegie Mellon University, and I really appreciated um, your point in the middle of the talk about moving from the top-level schools uh, down to schools that uh, may be underperforming and, and the need to support this sort of learning for all students. And I wondered if you could comment more on that aspect of the work and also maybe how that interacts with um, the ideas uh, around tracking or streaming of students? All right, thank you. <sighs> That's a difficult one. Um, <laughs> now, as a research outfit, um, of course, it's easier to work, as I said earlier, with schools that are already doing very well academically, so that when you want to experiment on informal learning designs, it's easier to get the data and so, from a research point of view, easier to publish. Um, but when those findings were reported to the ministry, they were rightfully wondering, now how does this apply to... We used to have this concept called Hamala, high achievers, mid achievers, and low achievers. And um, recently, in the, those international benchmarks, we had a longer tail. Though our, our average was always high, we had a longer tail. So if there's anything good arising from those benchmarks, it kind of revealed a, a, a problem that we were not looking after the tail very well. So as a result of that, as simple as that, the Ministry of Education felt that um, emphasis must be given to the lower progress students. And in tandem with that, uh, our research office, I believe, was asked to experiment in schools that are typical. And that actually enables a more generalizable um, sense of what we do. So um, that's the first question. Second question is streaming. Um, we have relaxed all these streaming things um, over the years. In fact, if you ask many parents these days, um, um, these used to be high maneuvers of the system in streaming has progressively been uh, removed. Um, while we have a system in which we try to um, put certain students in certain schools so that um, there's within school variability rather low for efficiency's sake of instruction. Um, and that, that served the system pretty well in, the, in times past. But I think going forward, the, uh, the ministry recognizes the need for um, non-streaming mechanisms, but changing the system is not an overnight affair, as far as I understand. Changing the system has to be done very slowly and carefully and progressively so that maybe after 10 years, when you look back, it looked like a radical change, but actually it was actually done very incrementally from the point of our policymakers. So the grade 6 national high 6 exam is an example where it was so high stakes and the minister kept saying, can we broaden the criteria, broaden the criteria? And he was here a few weeks, months ago, and he, he asked me, can we broaden the criteria? I, just, I, I, said, I think I said to him, I thought we just broadened it. <laughs> yeah. So basically, they're trying, they're making all kinds of efforts to lower the stakes. But sometimes, as much as the ministry can lower the stakes, the parents are, when they know what the criteria is, they know how to reach it. But when the criteria is all blurred up, parents actually get more worried because now they don't know what's the criteria and they actually become more intense and more stressed up. So sometimes these socio-dynamics are very hard to predict um, in our cultural context. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>